welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us to start our spring lecture series. Uh, and of course, uh, congratulations to the Jordanian national soccer team. They have made so much traffic for us tonight. I expect we'll have people joining us. Uh, we're of course, we're all very proud of them for making it into the finals. Uh, and uh, we are we are so pleased that you've joined us tonight uh, in this day of national celebration in their honor. Uh, and we hope to to talk to you about something else we think is quite wonderful for and with Jordan uh, and share in that experience with you as well. Uh, my name is Pierce Paul Creesman. For those of you joining us online, it's my pleasure uh, to serve as the executive director of ACOR. I'll do a little bit of housekeeping and then uh, turn us right over uh, to our speaker for this evening. First and foremost, if anybody is uh, still working on it, our fellowship applications are due on February 15th. That feels like very soon, three days from now. Uh, so please, if anyone is interested in doing research in or about Jordan, take a look at those uh, on our webpage. Uh, the more people we have uh, subscribing to those and applying for those, the more desire we can uh, explain to the world and, and try and bring more resources available to help understand the history, uh, cultures, and languages of this wonderful place. So we will have uh, our lecture tonight followed by three more this uh, this spring in the spring lecture series. Uh, some fella, oh, oh, nope, that's me. I'll be presenting on March 25th, a short lecture. Uh, because we will be in Ramadan, we will have a very brief tantalizing, dare I say, uh, talk uh, and then uh, move to an iftar. Uh, so that will be a shorter lecture than usual and we hope you will all join us uh, for iftar uh, then on, the, on March 25th. On April 22nd, uh, we'll speak about our, our uh, projects with the Department of Antiquities in Aqaba, Karak, and Beit Ross. We're very excited to have those. And then to close our lecture season, we'll speak about the National Inventory Project, uh, something that we are truly, truly honored to be shepherding uh, uh, with the department and on behalf of, uh, of everyone who loves heritage in Jordan. Uh, with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Matthew Vinson is the co-director for our National Inventory Project, but he also gets up to all kinds of other trouble, and he's going to talk about some of that this evening. Uh, don't be shy. Give him a hard time, and please join me in welcoming Matthew. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to be able to share with you a story of community archaeology. I think, again, everyone can probably hear me okay. I'm almost afraid to get too close to the microphone. Uh, if it's too loud, just raise your hand, wave at me, let me know. We'll go through this, no problem. Normally, you see a thank you slide at the end of a presentation, but in this case, I think it's actually very important to start with a thank you. First and foremost, we have to say thank you to the Department of Antiquities for making a project like this possible. This is a unique project here in Jordan, and a lot of that has to do with their trust and their faith in us to be able to execute a project like this. Um, but also their vision and willingness to see something like this happen in Jordan. I'm using ambiguous words there because I don't want to give all the way the spoilers just yet, but we will reveal uh, what this project is like, what we're looking at, and what we're doing. Um, and at the same time, I also have to say thank you to the leadership here at ACOR for engaging in a project like this, so for making it happen. I've been here at ACOR now for a year and a half-ish, um, and this was one of those extracurricular activities that was uh, handed over to me. And as a field archaeologist, it was a tremendously exciting opportunity to be involved with both the community and the archaeology here in Amman. Um, and it's been something that's really exciting. We'll get into the details in just a moment here. This was another one of those extracurricular activities that happened at the beginning of last year. I was asked to do a photogrammetric acquisition on the south side of the Citadel. So I'm standing here. And I'm using my camera, I'm taking all the pictures, thousands of pictures that we need to make a 3D model of this part of the Citadel. Car after car after car drives by this section of the Citadel without a missing a beat. Every single one of those cars, someone's hanging out the window yelling, when is the hub? <laughs> and suddenly you begin to realize that there's a really big disconnect when it comes to the understanding of archaeology here in Jordan, the process that we're doing, and the things that we're engaged in. I began to have some conversations with some of my friends here in the country, and I would ask them, 
what do you know about archaeology and archaeologists? And for the vast majority of my friends, local friends here in Jordan, they were like, yeah, it's a bunch of foreigners who come out here looking for gold. And I was like, okay, so there's definitely a little bit of a disconnect that happens with these sorts of things. So now we need to start thinking about what is community archaeology? Um, so eh, I seem to have lost my slide again. There we go. There's a lot of text on this slide, so I want to try to break it down with some of the really important points when we think about what community archaeology is. Number one, actively involving the local community in the archaeological research process. It's defined by collaborative partnerships between professional archaeologists and community members aiming to make archaeology accessible, relevant, and to a wider audience. Now, one thing I want to just say as a caveat at the beginning here, that collaborative partnership between professional archaeologists and community members doesn't necessarily mean that it's the professional archaeologist initiating it. Some of the examples that I have here actually show community groups that begin a project and engage professional archaeologists as part of their heritage management of their area. But for the most part, I think we generally see this as initiative led by professional archaeologists who wish to engage with a local community. So let's have a few examples first off of what community archaeology looks like. So in the Crow Canyon area uh, in Colorado, uh, the local archaeologists there engaged Native American communities to help become stewards of the site and kind of guide and work with them, learn some of the process, be involved in the archaeology there. Now, a couple of things happened out of that. First and foremost was a sense of ownership for their own heritage. So the Native American communities have been disconnected from uh, Mesa Verde, from some of their local areas, some of their ancient history that had been part of their families for generations. And through the archeological process and being involved in it, they gained a renewed appreciation for their own heritage. But probably more important is they became stewards of the site. In fact, they began setting up uh, community watch groups to keep an eye on the site, to make sure no one was messing with it, no one was looting the site. And so it's a really incredible example of how engaging that community actually ends up helping to preserve the site. Um, in Kusar in Egypt, there's another example of where uh, this Ottoman fort needed some work done on it. Professional archaeologists engaged the young people there taught them the skills, taught them how to work on the site, taught them how to do these things. And next thing you know, these young guys are getting employed to work on archeological sites because of the training that they had there. So they're developing skills, they're getting training because of their involvement with community archeology. span In the Orkney Islands in Scotland, uh, there's another example where the local community, and this is the one that I'm using, where they actually are the ones initiating it. It was a local heritage society. So we're talking about more aficionados, um, you know, professionals in their own right, but not necessarily archaeologists. And they have their sites that they want to look after, they want to protect, they want to work on, and they're bringing in archaeologists from outside. But they really insisted on training everyone in the local community to be part of this, um, as opposed to bringing out outside experts. So whenever they needed to do the uh, capacity building, they would bring someone down, train them, and then they would have those people employed locally to work on the site, to manage the site. It was then the local community that developed all the tourism strategies for the site. So they were able to define what they thought would be sustainable, manageable without damaging the site and with respecting uh, the boundaries of the site and what they wanted for it. So they were able to develop plans that made it a lot more accessible, sustainable, um, and things that they were able to manage and control, but they did that in collaboration with professional archaeologists. And finally, as another example, in Silchester in, in uh, England, um, was awareness and education. So they had a heavy engagement in training. So they would go in, for example, the primary school, secondary school classes, and they would teach lessons on what they were doing out there. And as you can see, they have quite a busy activity area. And I like the fact that in this one uh, spot right here, we see what is uh, clearly a member of the public wandering through the site. So they would have open days during the archaeological process where they would just invite the community to come in, look at what they're doing, have a look at what's happening in the site, probably do some of the explaining around there, 
um, and possibly being involved in the actual excavation itself. So now the questions are why community engagement? I think these four examples already are compelling enough, but let's get into some of the specifics of what we can actually get from it. Integrating local insights with professional research for enriched discovery. Quite a mouthful of a sentence, but I think this is perfectly encapsulated with a little anecdote that happened to me the other day. I was driving back with a geophysicist from Scotland and we're talking about community archeology span and he shares with me, he's like, oh yeah, we had this project running uh, you know, nearby my hometown and these archeologists came in and they started interviewing everyone and, and people are really excited that there's gonna be this archeological project and people start pulling out these pots that have been in their family for generations. And they start telling a story, oh yeah, my grandmother used to use it like this, or my grandmother used to do that. And all of a sudden the archeologists have this light bulb moment of like, we never even understood how some of these things were being used. And it was that engagement with the local community that actually helped them understand uh, some of the local insights for how some of this material was being used. So by engaging with the local community, sometimes we have an opportunity to gain new insights that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise have through conversations, interviews, and interactions. Empowering locals with active roles in heritage exploration and preservation, fostering deeper connections uh, with the history. And again, this is one of those things when oftentimes we have this sort of walled garden where people are hidden behind uh, working in sites that people can't even access, where there may be even a guard that doesn't even let them anywhere near the site. By bringing the community onto the site, they now become part of the process. Now they can ask that question, what's happening here? What's going on here? And being part of the actual process of uh, archeological exploration. One of the things that stands out to me, and this comes from um, Abdun itself, uh, one of the first days that I was working there, uh, we were doing some uh, excavations in one of the top loci, uh, modern surface material, and we pull out a key. And this key happens to be, I could find the brand on it, and I would say, oh, okay, let's look this up. So we Googled the key, and we know, okay, it comes from a factory in China. When was that factory uh, uh, built? And it was something like 1936. I say, okay, so now we know that layer where this key ca came from can't be older the 1936. And all of a sudden, people are kind of having light bulb moments where before they would have looked at that key and they said, this is a piece of trash. But now they looked at that key and they say, wait a second, this key now tells us a little bit of information about this layer in the ground and what's happening there. And it became a really exciting moment that just from one key coming from somewhere in China uh, became this really exciting thing. Also for the archaeologists in the room, the funny part is, is we talk about import wear as being really, really important and showing you know, signs of elite status symbols and everything else. It's a key from China. So in this case, it's probably not indicating elite occupation of the site, um, but it did amuse me a little bit to look at that and think about that part of it. Demystifying the process and promoting respect for heritage through firsthand experience. So building on what we're talking about there by having them involved in every step of the way. Uh, we were very privileged to have a large group of volunteers that came and joined us this summer um, that wanted to actually continue all of the work. And they said, no, no, let us come to ACOR. Let us wash the pottery. Let us help learn what this is doing. And washing the pottery is kind of the part that everyone hates because you're sitting there with a bucket of water scrubbing dirt off of effectively baked dirt. And people get really frustrated with that process. But by getting involved with that and, and seeing how it works and seeing how the pieces of pottery become one of the most fundamental tools that we rely upon in archeology, span they're also getting excited about that. Fostering support for site conservation by aligning archeologists and local interests for sustainability. Again, this conversation that I was having with our geophysicist from Scotland the other day you know, we were talking a lot about this need for having that dialogue between archeologists and the local community. It's one thing for us as archeologists to go in and say, we think this site needs to have this and this and this and this and this. But we also need to hear what is the desire of the local community. What do they want out of the sites that they're effectively the stewards of? And by involving them in this conversation, by involving them in that process, they can begin to also feel ownership for that site and be committed to the process of being stewards of that site, protecting that site and maintaining that site, because they're going to be there for generations beyond when any archaeologist is there. 
they are the stewards of those sites. So by engaging them in that process, as early as we can, they also become invested in the long-term maintenance of these sites. Now, broadening, broadening the access to archaeology. So this is one of those words that we hear a lot nowadays, democratizing, insert whatever you want to hear. Democratizing heritage. This is actually something that's quite important, however. So this is making archaeological knowledge and participation available to everyone, not just academics or those with prior interest. This is one of those issues that we oftentimes run into with academia. You say, okay, this article is published there. Right, so if you're in a premier category, top league university with access to all the journals in the world, you can read that article. But sometimes you might not be able to do that from your home, or you might have to pay 30, 40, 50 euros to read one article. So this is one of those issues that we start facing in academia in general. And obviously the journals, they need to have some sort of sustainability as well. They need to make money off of what they're doing. But democratizing access to heritage is also meaning being able to let the public have access to these information to be able to understand what's happening. So that might mean as archeologists, we're making very conscious choices, not only to publish in journals that may have a paywall behind it, but also to publish in journals that people might be able to download that article. For example, everything that we do here in ACOR, you can download it. So publishing within our own mediums here means that people would have access to that material inside and outside of ACOR without any hindrance to it whatsoever. So that means that anyone can access that information, be able to read it, whether they're a professional or whether they're a hobbyist. Inclusive participation, encouraging people from all walks of life, including underrepresented groups to take part in archeological activities and decision-making. And again, this is one of those things that we can think about, you know, whether it's, um, you know, non-professionals coming from all over the city. So maybe we have a baker who wants to come and work on archeology span and they might think, oh, what can I do here? I'm just a baker. It's like, no, please join us, have this opportunity, have access to this, learn what archaeology is like. Um, and of course, that's just one sector, but it's also seeking out other communities that might even have issues getting out there, whether it's due to transportation uh, or whatever it might be involving, you know, school groups that might be a little bit further away and making sure that they have the ability to engage with archaeology. And when we talk about the uh, decision-making process, that's always a little bit more difficult in the archaeological process, because as archaeologists, we might know, due to a professional formation and activity, where things might be, what are good areas to dig in. But it doesn't mean that we can't involve local communities in that decision-making process to talk about it, to say, where do you think we ought to dig next? And why do you think that? And then also be able to talk about our reasoning. Why would we choose a particular area to dig? What is it that we're seeing? And why would we go there? And that involves everybody. And then they can also understand what the indicators are, why we might think about it. And again, they're going to be looking at it and saying, yeah, because they're wanting to see that pottery and they're wanting to see that rubbish that helps them understand what the site is, how it functioned and when it comes from. Cultural connectivity. So we're bridging cultural gaps by involving communities in the exploration of their own and others heritage, fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation across cultures. I've been coming and working in Jordan now for 20 years. And I remember one of the first things that our dig director shared with us in, in my first excavation is, you will become an ambassador for Jordan when you are back home. And that's part of this cross-cultural connectivity that we talk about. It's me learning about Jordan and bringing that information back home. Likewise, I also represent a foreign culture to the people of Jordan in whatever I'm doing. And that's being able to share what are the things that I think about? What is my culture? How do I interpret it? Why in the world am I here investigating Jordan's cultural heritage? So it's bridging some of these gaps that we see. Um, and this is particularly with the example of foreign expeditions coming into the country and connecting with local communities and why that's so important. But if, even if we think about local communities, so you know, take some of the projects that we saw in the United Kingdom, we're saying, well, what you know, cross-cultural work are we talking about here? But it is always still that. And even if we talk about the culture of academia and the popular culture that we see in the site, there's always a cultural gap between the people who are there, the local community and the professionals. And there's always something to be able to connect together in those areas.
Volunteer opportunities. So offering a range of volunteer roles within archaeological projects to suit different interests, abilities, and availabilities, lowering the barriers to entry. One of the first things I always share with everyone when they come onto the site is, you don't have to do this for the four hours that you signed up to. If you find this horrendous after the first hour, sit down, relax, enjoy. This is not you know, forced labor that we're making you do. We want people to enjoy all aspects of it. And again, you know, part of it might be is like, okay, maybe you're just interested in doing some of the documentation. So sit down and work on documentation. Maybe you're interested in doing photography. Okay, let's engage you in the photography. There's all kinds of different roles that we have in archeology span that are important and people can see ways that they can contribute through their own volunteer time. And again, I take that one uh, particular group that was so interested in learning about the pottery that they practically begged Fadis, like, can we come here to Acor and wash pottery with you? And they wanted to experience a different level, a different uh, part of the archaeological process. So there's many ways that we can engage volunteers that doesn't just mean excavation in the field. And that's part of that process. We're not just looking for labor. We're looking for people to be involved in every aspect of the archaeological process. And local empowerment. So empowering local communities by involving them directly in archeological projects that explore their heritage, giving them a stake in preservation and interpretation of their own history. And again, fundamentally, this is what we're looking at with community archeology. span When people are working at a site and they're involved with the archeological span process and they're involved with the conversations that the archeologists have on the site, because archeologists are constantly debating, what is this that we found? What is this thing here? We don't quite understand this. Maybe this is that, maybe this is the other thing. And I had that, that conversation the entire season last year at Abdoon, like with one particular object. I had one idea at the beginning of the season and by the end of the season, it had changed completely. And involving the local community in that and talking about that process, you know, not having to kind of be in this position where I'm saying, oh, I understand everything about the site. No, I don't. I don't understand it, but we're discovering it and we're learning it. And we think this might be that thing. This might be that other thing. Getting them engaged in that helps them also to be empowered in, in working through their own understandings of their local heritage um, and what it's like to be part of the interpretation process of what some of these things might be. Socioeconomic inclusion. And I think this is one that's very important. When we think about a lot of archaeological opportunities, they're expensive. If you sign up for an excavation, it oftentimes means that you're gonna be spending thousands and thousands of dollars to be part of an excavation. That's prohibitive for a lot of people. And I mean that for a lot of people around the globe. So by offering opportunities where someone can come, doesn't have to pay a thing, can just come on the site and enjoy the process of archeology span for a day, it means that there's no barriers to that access. They have the opportunity to just come to their own city and be able to work on an archeological span project without any problems, without any commitments uh, financially or otherwise. So that's really an important part of the community archeology span to make it accessible to everyone, all kinds of diverse groups in the process. So what are some of the benefits and outcomes that we get from community archeology? span So first off, strength and community ties. You get the archeologists working with local communities, they get excited about it, they feel like it's part of their project. There's some of the volunteers in the room here today that probably feel like Abdun is their project. And that's what we want. We want people to feel like this is something that they own, that they're actively part of, that this is their project as well as our project. So archeological span participation fosters this sort of social co cohesion, a bringing together of diverse community members through shared heritage experiences. You're out there digging in the sun for four hours a day. You're sweating, it's hot, it's not always feeling good to you. That bonds people together, as well as the excitement of discovery that happens in the archeological span process. Cultural heritage preservation. So community engagement in archeology span empowers locals to become active stewards of their heritage, ensuring its protection and transmission to future generations. I think one of the key words here again that came through in the examples is this idea of ownership. When people feel like it's theirs, they want to keep it. They want to keep it nice. They want to protect it. They don't want people coming in and looting it or hurting it or anything else. So cultural heritage preservation happens through this sort of process where we're plugging in the local community and getting them involved. And then they're also becoming stewards and protectors 
of their local archaeology. Education enrichment, hands-on archaeological activity. You can't beat it. Getting out there in the field, being involved in the process is a unique learning opportunity that you can't ever get in the classroom. And it enhances public understanding and appreciation of the historical and cultural contexts that we have. Enhance local identity and pride. You get excited about what is your cultural heritage. We think about today, you know, Jordan came in second place. We have all this uh, pride around Jordan's football team today. You know, traffic is a nightmare. You couldn't go anywhere in the city. But people are excited. They feel the pride for it. In the same way that when you get involved in the archaeology, you feel like it's part of you. It's part of your community. It's part of your story. And it's something you then get really excited to talk about. Um, I could guess again that a lot of the volunteers who participated in the digs go home and talk about it. They're like, oh, man, you wouldn't believe what we saw today. You wouldn't believe what we discovered. And it becomes part of a storytelling that they go and share with other people and get them involved with that as well. So let's look a little bit about what it actually looks like to be on the site. So we run it Fridays and Saturdays, so weekends where no one else has any uh, specific work obligations, they have the opportunity to come. Again, we're looking at the lowest entry barriers. What are the days that we can run this that members of the community come? 8 to 12 p.m. Uh, if you were running any other dig, they'd probably make you go out there at 5 a.m. We're humane. We're kind to people. We want them to be able to come out at a normal hour. So 8 to 12 p.m., we have a little break in the uh, middle where we have some tea. If people brought snacks, they can do that. Um, and one of the kind of exciting things that happened is we switched our sign-up process to Eventbrite, which actually meant that we got some more organic people signing up. So they weren't just part of the ACOR community already, but people who are in Amman got on an event, right, and says, hey, what's, what's happening in town? What can I do? And we actually got a significant number of volunteers through that that hadn't heard of the project otherwise. So that's kind of one of the exciting things um, that happened out of that part of it. Um, and then volunteers participate in all aspects of the work. So whether it's being involved in survey and the excavation and sampling. So that might be uh, dealing with some of the pottery or looking at other parts of uh, the site, um, sifting, recording. So the documentation aspects of it, the volunteers have opportunities to be in ev involved in every aspect of the archeological process. Now, I don't want to end this discussion about community archaeology without actually talking about some of the things that we discovered in Abdoon this last year that I think are incredibly exciting. And again, this is all thanks to uh, the volunteers who worked with us. So I haven't talked too much about the site yet. I wanted to get into the general aspects of, um, of community archaeology. But now I want to show you where the site is at, what we're doing there, and a couple of things that came out of there. So this is Abdun. That's uh, Taj Mahal there. So this is the Saudi embassy, and this is the Japanese park. And so that's the location of the site. And the other thing that I want you to keep an eye on is this area up here, because we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, as we get closer, this is so you can see the general layout of the site itself. So this is the actual Japanese park. This is the site itself, which, by the way, has a couple of names. It's either Qasr Abdun, as it was uh, when Nelson Glick surveyed the site back in the 30s, or officially as it's known, it's Kirbit Abdun Southeast. That's a mouthful. I tend to say Qasr Abdun because it's sort of fun, and Qasr sound really cool. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the formation that you see here, and that's why it got the name of Qasr most likely, um, or it could be from some of the tower formations there. This is a fairly recently planted forest that, if I understand correctly, was done as an experiment uh, together with a Scandinavian university, but is meant to be the site of the new Turkish embassy. Um, so this is both a blessing and a curse in the sense that it you know, risks disrupting the archaeology in the area. But on the other hand, it means that it's potentially the most secure site in all of Amman. If we've got the Turkish embassy here, Saudi, Saudi embassy there, no one's going to mess with the site. So I kind of am happy about that as long as they don't dig anywhere too close to the site when they want to build the embassy. So this is an actual plan of the site that we have itself. Now, this structure that you see on the outside here is actually most likely a late Ottoman sheep pen. So this was built, or let's call it a more generic, an animal pen. It's built to keep animals in there. But you look at it, and it looks like you got a big old fort going on there. Um, but we also have uh, remnants of some towers that are up here, a tower that's running here, 
and some really large structure that you can't really tell it from this map, but uh, it's pretty big. And it's uh, the large rough hewn limestone blocks that are typical of the Iron Age, uh, especially here in Amman. We've now gridded the entire site. So we've got a hundred squares, five by five meters um, that we can easily lay out anytime we wanna dig any of the squares. Um, and we can uh, just pick it out with the GPS. We go to it, lay it out, and we're able to excavate that one square. We're generally digging four by four meters, leaving a one meter bulk on the north and the east side uh, for our vertical control. These are the areas that we've excavated so far. So this is that large kind of wall. This is right on the edge of that sheep pen. And so we took the opportunity to first excavate on the inside of this area. Um, and we haven't found a lot inside that area so far. In fact, uh, square 54 here, we did a two by two meter probe, went down about 50 centimeters and it was completely sterile. It was just crumbly rock sitting out there. So we can say that the archeological layers are very low at this point. Um, we have some more exciting things happening up here. There's a large pile of um, Byzantine ashlars that are sitting there. Right next to it is something that looks very similar to the uh, limestone kilns that were found when uh, the Madaba Plains project did their survey, the hinterland survey. They found a lot of these, it looks a lot like it. So one of the questions is, is all of that limestone block stacked up here just set for this kiln? And they were stacking it up, getting ready to burn it. That's one of the questions that we need to answer next year. There's an exciting piece that we'll talk about shortly here in square 43. And a couple exciting things that happened here in 84 and 85 and 77 and 78. Um, these bits here in the blue are what I think are remnants still of the Iron Age occupation in the site. Uh, the yellow is ambiguous at this point because we haven't done enough investigation in those areas to say whether or not that's part of it. The red is all of that sheep pen wall. And we've got another sort of wallish thing on the very southern edge that we're not quite sure of. When we first looked at the site here and we were looking at this, it looked like we had a casemate wall system, classic of the Iron Age. Um, turns out it wasn't. We did a geophysical survey in hopes that we could find some information about the site. So we actually ran uh, the geophysical survey inside the site over that forest area where that embassy is going to be built and over one of the um, humps that is just south of the site that had a very interesting looking ridge. The forest revealed nothing. So there's no indication of any archeological remains whatsoever in the forest. So build the embassy if you need to. That hump appears to be a modern rubbish dump. So, you know, we thought it might've been archeological. It turns out it's very recent instead. Um, and within the site, we got a lot of noise that no one is really too sure about how we can exactly interpret it. Um, and part of that is just the, the nature of the way that uh, the soil has been compacted there and also trying to run the radar over the site, which was incredibly rocky. So the GP GPR unit is bouncing all over the site, all over the place. We're continuing to work with the data and hoping that we can refine it a bit more because we did run it over the entirety of the interior of that site. But also, as I noticed before, and I mentioned before, the interior doesn't appear to have a lot of occupation. So the radar might not have much to reveal uh, in that part of the site. Um, okay, now, one of two things that I think is incredibly interesting. When I first came to the site, this block was sitting underneath the sheet pen wall. Notice these are the large, uh, uh, roughly hewn uh, limestone blocks that we have. This comes most likely from the Iron Age. And this is probably another side of that same Iron Age structure. It appears to run from behind it. And right in the middle of this, and I do mean right in the middle, in almost exactly 1.72 meters from either side of that wall is this block. Now, this is what I was talking about as we progress through our, our work and we try to understand what it is. Our initial theory was that this might have been a reused Hellenistic stone because it's got the classic embossed, embossed carving on there that the Bedouin dragged over and put into this wall because they're like, hey, this is a really big block. This is useful. And we're going to stick it in this wall so we don't have to drag a whole bunch of other stones over. Well, have another look at it. This is this really beautiful block. And when we excavated further, turns out that there is a foundation stone that it's sitting on. So all of a sudden we have a stone in situ that is some sort of installation that we still don't quite know when it was installed there. 
we're hoping that uh, in coming seasons, we'll be able to excavate behind this and actually get a stratified sequence that will help us to understand what's happening with this block. Uh, curiously, it appears that the block was abandoned um, because this chip happens in the middle of it. It looks like they were working on the embossment. Maybe someone messed up, chisel slipped, knocked this section out of there, and they didn't ever finish the embossing. So you've got these three beautiful layers on this side. Behind it, it's perfectly squared off in the back, and then they just stop. Look at how the edge ends right here. Look at how much more you have on this side. So they might have been working on it, abandoned it, and then just said, hey, we're going to just set this thing up right there. Interestingly enough, though, it's perfectly orientated to the east, almost to one degree or two degrees or so. So if you stick a compass on this, it will face exactly north. Um, so it's, you know, interesting. Is it significant? I don't know. But it's perfectly orientated to the east. And so again, that block is found right there. And that's what I was talking about before. We have one of those Iron Age walls here, another one right there, and it happens to be right in the middle of those areas. Um, another simple possibility is, is it was set up as a uh, pillar base. And so you might have had a wood beam sitting on top of that, and then some sort of roof covering over there. We don't know. We hope we find out uh, soon. The other really exciting thing we found this year was a Byzantine period press. So this is the press itself. We were excavating this area. And as I said, we thought this was a casemate wall. Uh, it looked classically like it when you looked at the surface remains. We start excavating on this and, and lo and behold, I noticed that there was a little line of plaster there. So we were doing some kind of bulk work. We had some workmen in working with us, removing this whole area, preparing it for some uh, other excavation. And I was like, hang on a second. And I start peeling away, peeling away, peeling away, peeling away. And next thing you know, you got this huge line of plaster. And then we start digging and digging and digging, and that goes almost a meter deep. So it's a fairly large press. I don't know what type of press this is just yet. Um, if we have an olive oil press, I would expect we would see a secondary basin there. Um, if it's a wine press, we might not have that. We do have the remnants of the pressing floor on this side, and you can see uh, the channel between these two stones that runs right here. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, many layers of plaster. So this thing was clearly reused multiple times. Uh, they continued replastering that basin. Um, and we counted at least four or five different layers when you looked at them um, quite closely there. So um, the second thing that we see here, you see this really dark splotch. We suspect this might be another basin because there's a very big plant that's grown in there. And those plaster line basins would retain a lot of uh, moisture, a lot of water. And so it might make a perfect area uh, for another basin to be. When we started excavating up here, um, oh, sorry, that's the other press that I was about to mention. Um, so I have another photo of it that will come. There is another pressing floor right here. So that pressing floor, we haven't yet found a channel that would lead to this, but maybe it goes this way, maybe it runs diagonally, we don't know quite yet, but it appears that we have a secondary pressing floor, and if we have the opportunity, we will uh, start opening that up and hopefully reveal a second press. Now, just to the north of the site is a rather large complex of presses that we have at a site known as uh, Hirbet Abdun North. This would have been visible to our site at Qasr Abdun. Uh, removing all the modern buildings, you would have seen the site without any problems. And they're uh, all of 850 meters apart from each other, so not uh, far at all. So that's where our site is, and that's where the secondary site is right there. So what this indicates, we can't exactly say at this point, but we clearly have some sort of connected uh, industry in the area, whether it's just the Byzantine, Byzantine thing to do. You build a house, you build a press or if we're looking at a wider industry in the area, those are questions that have yet to be answered and might be quite difficult to do because of the loss of archeology span in Abdun. However, it is important to note that this, had, uh, this is quite a significant complex that we have there. And uh, hopefully we'll find more presses in the site and helps to uh, give a bigger picture of the area. Um, and then that is the other pressing floor that uh, we have in there. Uh, as you can see, it's got that perfect layout of it, but we only have about three or four blocks so far, um, but we hope to uh, expose a lot more of that press. So future work, we hope uh, if we're able to continue the project in 2024, we would like to continue investigating the presses. 
Um, we have, uh, we want to get more of the context for the one and opening up that secondary press, particularly that basin. So we're going to have to do a careful removal of the sheep pen wall, remove that plant and hopefully reveal a secondary basin. And then whatever channels or whatnot that we're not able to find at the moment will hopefully still be preserved underneath that sheep pen wall. We would like to remove significant amounts of that sheep pen wall to really reveal the Byzantine occupation, because it seems on the southern side of the site is where the Byzantines uh, were, were located. And again, if, it, if there's that possibility that actually all of that Byzantine rubble on the north of the site was removed from the south of the site. So we might actually find quite a bit uh, uh, more of the structures that are there. Um, we need to open up the area around that ashlar to understand its context and function. So opening up immediately to the west of it should hopefully get us a lot more stratified areas because those are all in, contained within the walls of that Iron Age area. So then hopefully we can figure out is this stone set up in the Iron Age? Is it later? We'll find out. Um, and then we there's a couple areas right next to the ashlar that are very interesting. And one had a significant pottery deposit in it that raises a lot of questions. What is happening there? Uh, what can we expect and how is it related to the, uh, uh, the ashlar that's there? So those are just four of the things that we would like to do archeologically in this coming season um, at Abdun. Now, before I close, I'm not gonna read it from the slide. I have just uh, some words that I felt would be probably if I read out as a thank you to the volunteers who made this possible for us in 2023. So reflecting on the 2023 season at Qasr Abdun, Profound appreciation is owed to the remarkable volunteers whose dedication and hard work played a pivotal role in its success. These individuals, through their generous contribution of time, energy, and talents, not only propelled the project forward, but also enriched the archaeological community and the local area with their enthusiasm and spirit of collaboration. Their efforts have been instrumental in bridging the past with the present, fostering a deeper connection to our history and understanding the invaluable role of community and the stewardship of cultural heritage. The achievements, achievements of this season stand as a testament to the power of collective effort and volunteerism in archeology, span leaving an indelible mark on the project and reminding us all of the profound impact such dedication can have on preserving our collective past. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful presentation and a great review of uh, of what we've been doing, getting up to Inab Doom. Uh, ACOR's mission is advancing knowledge, and I'm very pleased to see us uh, and our projects engaging folks widely in this way. Over the past two years, we've had hundreds of people join us uh, in the field in Abdoon, and we are hopeful uh, in, in collaboration with the Department of Antiquities to pick back up again this year, but like everybody, we have an application in and we'll let you know if we get permission to do the work like everybody else here. So the work does still go through all of the other uh, standards and rigorous reviews as all other archeology span in the country. I think it's important to keep that in mind, uh, but we're excited about it. And hopefully some of you will come join us again. We have some time for questions if anybody's interested. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. And for the job that Acre is doing here in Georgia, I think it's tremendous. Uh, just a comment and a question for the past. I think we can't really blame the locals, the Danish, for their gold issue because history and facts talks a lot about that. Now, the second uh, volunteering thing is, is impressive, but do you put them through a training course before you send them to the field? Let me handle the gold one. The gold thing is not a comment on Jordan. This is universal. I grew up in, in the United States and people would go out with their metal detectors looking for gold. I've worked in a dozen different countries, including the United States. Everybody thinks, what are these lunatics doing? They wouldn't be out here if there wasn't something valuable. And of course, there is something valuable, which you all know, and it's rarely gold. Gold makes things harder, slows things down, and almost never tells us anything. So unless there's something stamped into it. Uh, so it's of course the other things that, that are our treasure. Okay. No, and I'd, I'd add to that too. I mean, it's, you know, practically fault of, of our culture, our myths that we build, you know, look at Indiana Jones, look at Tomb Raider, you know, the films that are quote unquote cultural heritage and it's all about looting. Um, so it is what it is. I mean, 
they're spectacular fiction. I'll put that out. There. I don't want anybody to attack us on social media. <laughs> no, absolutely spectacular. But it is the reality of myths that we build. Uh, in terms of the volunteers, we train them on site um, on the day. And to be you know honest, like this is the process that most of us go through as volunteers in archaeology. It's not like we go through a long, rigorous training course. We're put out in the field. You know, we might get a couple hours of like, this is how you use your hand pick. This is how you use a trowel. Um, you know, what happens usually within the first hour of people working on the site, I'm walking around constantly. And, you know, a lot of it is, honestly, you get two types of volunteers, the ones who are ready to just dig, 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 dig without any regard for anything whatsoever. Uh, and then you have the ones who are so scared of hurting the archaeology that they're moving it a speck at a time. You know, so we're always tr looking to strike that balance, helping people to be a bit more vigorous when they can be and helping people to go a bit more shui shui when they should. And, and part of it is is getting over that fundamental hurdle of how do you know if you don't know? How do you know you could be excited about archaeology and history if you never have a chance? So one of the things that we were really grateful to be able to do is engage some of the, the local schools, get them out, bring them on tours. And we hope to do more of that in the future, because that's how you find more people like yourselves who get curious about a thing. And a little bit of moving the dirt, especially when we're in these upper layers and it's, it's much more recent and we know that certain areas are sterile based on our controlled probes. And then you discover things. As long as people don't walk away with stuff in their pockets, we can probably resolve it. So, and we don't seem to be having any of those kinds of problems. Yeah. And I want to thank you of course, we want to thank you for the uh, wonderful work that they're doing. I want to ask about the press. How did you know it's a Byzantine? How is it different from an European question? And if you can, you know, tell us some mm -hmm. of the features of uh, both. And if there are other pressures also, other than the Byzantine. I'm just going to repeat the question because, of course, we are streaming this, so we got to remember uh, without passing out the microphone since it's making weird noises. Uh, the question that we have is, uh, how do we know that the press is, is Byzantine? Um, what other presses do we have in the area and what other periods are, are covered with the presses? How is it different from the Nabataeans? Sure. Um, all right. So first off, how do we know it's Byzantine? Pottery. Um, so the pottery that we were able to pull out from the press uh, is clearly Byzantine. Um, and of course, the day that we found it, uh, Jihad, I think, was in the office at that day. And I was texting him. No, you were at home that day. And I was texting Jihad and I was like, what is this? And he was doing the research and he like within 10, 15 minutes sends back near perfect parallels of Byzantine presses in the wider region. So we can tell by construction style. We can tell by some of those things. It's clearly Byzantine. We see presses all throughout history in one form or another. So we get very crude presses in the Iron Age, which could literally just be a hole in the ground and a kind of stomping area where you crush something in one way or another. Um, I don't know exactly how it, it differs from a Nabataean press. I'm not that familiar with Nabataean period. Um, but, you know, there's a lot that stays the same. At the end of the day, you're just looking for a big weight to crush whatever you have and put it in some sort of filtration process, which is usually two sets of basins. If you're dealing with olive oil, because you have a very heavy kind of um, mess that sets in one, and then you want the liquid to flow into the second. Um, and then oftentimes, if you're dealing with grapes, you can kind of sift it out in other ways. Um, but yeah, we have a long history of presses. The presses in Petra, for example, they have the design that uh, is different from the presses in Marsas, and different from the presses in, uh, in uh, up north, you know, mm -hmm. in um, so uh, with the, uh, the design of the Byzantine press, we uh, also, uh, you know, special one. Um, I think every every press you get introductions of new technology. So you know, one of the things that we start seeing with the Romans is the screw type presses, mm -hmm. where they're basically able to screw a thing down, whereas before they're stacking weights. They're literally putting stone after stone after stone on top where they have some sort of lever process to it. So you get advances in technologies with different periods. Each region has something that might be particular to it. You get to Petra, you get sandstone. It's really easy to just carve out a new press whenever you need it. You try to carve that out of limestone, it's a lot more work. Um, so you know, you, you just have the, the, the sort of local context might contribute to how like the difference in those presses might be. More questions? Yes. 
special buses. We have another one in the middle of the fair that are pulling down at the end of the day. We have not found another one. Yeah. And it's also the same design. But all of this is not uh, belongs to the earlier fuel more than design. Yeah. So the early those area has a, a very much fertile area. It could be uh, have that type of uh, vine. Mm -hmm. which makes sense that we have a lot of these uh, cutters in the whole okay. so, so the comment is again just for our online audiences is that uh, there's quite a uh, uh, many of these presses around the Abdoon area the Abdoon Valley um, although you were saying a lot of them are, are appearing to be from the earlier part of the Byzantine period um, I would say particularly for our site we are seeing in our pottery sequence that we definitely have Byzantine all the way through Mayad um, so we're making an assumption right now, and I do say that, you know, with with a caveat of it's an assumption at the moment that we might have a reflection of what we're seeing at Kirbet Abdun, which is uh, 470 to 607, if I re recall correctly, uh, based on the coins um, that were dated there. Uh, other than that, you know, so far, what we really are lacking is stratified pottery sequences or other really significant dating material that we have. So we hope to be able to get that more. Um, we may be looking, and, and one of my theories is that this is actually an earlier uh, occupation at the site, that then we see a much more significant complex uh, built to the north. Thank you so much, Matthew. I'm very happy that I have been able to do this because uh, in 2022, when the Englishmen uh, in the mind, we did have a day around for all Manti, uh, Amonite, and say a ruin and tower. And we have a lot of pictures with your uh, at June. Uh, mm -hmm. But I want to say from our business, uh, I remember one public article uh, where I did a uh, work uh, with my goods, a uh, yeah. mm. And uh, a written policy, he had registered also a very large block of limestone mm. and has been engraved another thing on each side. Mm. And this building was. Uh, identified as a temple by Uri Shudnas and who published uh, an article about it. If this could be also another temple, for example, or is it similar to the limestone block which where I can see at Sahara uh, a So right. everywhere you go, you have those large limestone blocks. They must have a, a function. Uh, but uh, you know, as you said, we, have, we don't know exactly. It has been known at the uh, Nicosi, the mm -hmm. but could be also the same. Yeah. We didn't show any, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to say, I mean, it's any uh, ammonite uh, potential or something. It seems that we could, we didn't find any of those. Say, don't heckle him later. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Zaydan. Just again for our online audiences, uh, the comparison was being made with uh, Rujam al Kursi, which uh, has similar sort of tower construction as well as another large carved limestone block, uh, that one with an inscription. Um, and, you know, I can't tell you how many times people are telling me Rujam al Kursi looks just like this. Um, yes, yes. We have a picture. Yeah. We have a big side. Yeah. At one of those sides, they have not exactly that they have like about a hard point yes. yeah. that correlated to the VC uh, side. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We um, have 2,000 years to get through before that's our yeah. issue. I saw some hands in the back over here. Yes, please. Okay. The question. The question is, how old is the site? So it, it appears uh, at this point in time from our pottery sequence that our oldest occupation of the site is sometime in the Iron Age. I'm not going to get too much more specific at that point, uh, and main, mainly because we're lacking stratified sequences right now. So there's a lot of material that seems to be washing around that's jumbled up and mixed. I mean, uh, even in front of that, uh, the, the carved ashlar, we're finding 
modern plastic bags at levels that we don't want to find modern plastic bags. Um, but we're hoping this next season, that's one of the things we really want to clarify is that pottery sequence. And then it goes pretty much all the way up to the Amayad, which of course matches uh, other occupation in the area. And we had one possible Abbasid shirt, uh, which is another Islamic period shirt, which might just come from a water jar. So someone's possibly walking by, drops their water bottle, says, oh man, chucks the shirt and keeps going. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the, the answer you were looking for. There was a key from the 1930s or something. <laughs> yes. And it could probably go back to 1000 BC. Yeah. It could go back that far. It depends on how you have to get to the bottom to figure these things out. But sometime in the first thousand yeah. years BC would seem pretty reasonable based on what we're seeing now. But I know we say periods and what does that mean to each person at each time? And if you're not a specialist, how do you know these things? <laughs> yeah, so roughly 1200 BC, maybe the beginning, more likely around 1000 BC, 1936 <laughs> as our latest occupation. Any other questions? Well, we thank you all for being here tonight. Another round of applause for Matthew. Let me check to make sure if we have questions online. It means I have to know how There's to use online. Button up there. I can't be trusted with this. It's on the other screen. Oh, it's on the other yeah. screen. Ah. Uh, is it possible to receive an attendance certificate? Uh, so this is not a thing that we are certifying at this time. Uh, but we can certainly provide a letter if anyone would like to participate on ACOR letterhead saying that you were out here for this many hours and we were pleased to have you there or not if you were a turkey the entire time. But uh, we will we can happily do that so that people can have a record of having joined us on the site. Uh, and yes, we do hope to incorporate volunteers into the 2024 season, uh, but we don't want to put the uh, cart before the horse, as I mentioned. We do apply for permission to the government and the Department of Antiquities will consider our reports, our work and, and what we've done uh, and then review our request. And we hope in the not so distant future, say, let's get back to work. So and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Let's go have some snacks. Thank you.